So welcome again. Uh, we are covering today, create your own online public policy simulations for your class or publication. And we have a very full agenda today. What I want to do is um, start off by explaining what Epicenter is, what Forio Epicenter is, it is a platform for hosting, creating, and sharing simulations online. And then to give you a better sense for what can be done with this, I want to share a couple of completed simulation examples. So I'm going to go through those with you and show you a little bit around how those work and what are the features of them that can be recreated within Epicenter. The main part of today's webinar is really around simulation building. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by creating a model. And what, what I thought I could do for today is actually take you from a blank model and starting from scratch and building the model. Because I think that gives the, the greatest sense of how building a model works and what goes into it and things. We're going to do it very quickly. And we're going to do a very simple model today because we have very limited time, of course. Um, and then we're going to build a basic student interface around the model that we create. Um, and then create accounts. So the accounts that a student would use, for example, for logging into the simulation to give it a try. And then um, finally, what we're going to do is uh, do these facilitator pages. So you, how you can create a facilitator page for you as a faculty to log in and see student results. Then we're going to talk about next steps. And one of the things that we have is a NASPA account that's available for um, within Epicenter for creating your own simulations after this webinar is over. Um, and as I mentioned here, we're going to use a simple Excel model to illustrate, but of course, um, complex models also work well within the platform. So let me start off by explaining a little bit more about Forio Epicenter. So Epicenter is this online hosted computational platform for uh, authoring and hosting simulations, for right? doing interactive simulations. Um, so what you can do is you can take a model and what, we, what, we, what the platform does, it separates the logic of a simulation, which is you know, often built in Excel, or it can be built in Python or other simulation languages, um, it, but it separates that model logic from the interface. And the interface is done separately. It's something that you can build for creating a, a web interface to your model. And then there's mechanisms within there for sharing it with students and being able to um, have students do multiple runs and then compare results uh, within a class, for example. So Epicenter can share simulations. We can do other things too. It can share statistical analyses. Uh, it can share machine learning um, programs. It can share optimizations, other kinds of analytical models. To give you a little bit of a sense for what kinds of models or model logic can be put together for simulations, here's some of the languages, not quite all of them, but uh, a big portion of the languages that Epicenter supports. And what you see here, it, you know, at the very top row are system dynamics languages. Some of you might be familiar with um, with some of those, uh, but uh, they're actually not the most popular languages within the platform. Um, I'd say by far the most popular language for building a model is Excel. So that's what we're gonna use today to illustrate that. But other languages work as well. So we also have things like Python, R, Julia, um, SimLang, we have other languages too for doing interactive fiction style models. And um, because we support Python, we can do machine learning and AI techniques like TensorFlow and optimization like Ruby or Cflex and things like that. Um, but what I thought I could do right now would be just be fun to check in because I know a lot of you have run simulations either through NASPA or in your own classes. I wanna just do a quick poll to see where people's experience level is with simulation. So uh, four mutually exclusive questions that I'm asking right now uh, for it. And we just take a few seconds among everybody who's participating today, if you could just answer what your experiences are with simulations and what kinds of simulations you've used before. We'll just give it a few more seconds for people to fill out uh, the answers here, I see things coming in. And we're getting a range of results here. That's good. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll in four, three, two, one. And thanks very much for um, providing. I'm going to share the results with you now. You see, you can see the outcomes here. And uh, so we have most people here who are attending have never used a simulation before. Um, uh, there's quite a few people about even split between people who have either played a simulation as a user before um, or uh, have provided and debriefed a simulation to students, presumably a pre-made simulation uh, in, in those cases. So I guess people who have experienced simulation before are the, the majority here, but there's quite a few people who've never used a simulation. So it's a good idea, I suppose, today to jump into and explain a little bit more about what we mean by simulation and how this runs in context of, um, uh, uh, of what uh, Forio Epicenter can do. So what I'm gonna do here is um, go to, um, uh, show you some examples of online simulations that are, are, are already running. And 
you know, really there are three major types. There's other types of simulations too, but three major types of simulations that we see built with Epicenter. There's single player turn-based simulations. That's where one person makes decisions, advances and sees results and then advances again. So they go step by step. That's the turn-based aspect of the simulation. Uh, we also see multiplayer games where people play different roles and then in interact with each other in the same world. And then finally, there's a scenario uh, planning style simulations where uh, users will set policies and then advance those uh, over time and see what the, the impact of those policies might be on you know, effects on, on government or society or elsewhere. When, um, in the interest of time today, I'm only gonna show a couple of examples of those instead of all three. But what I wanna do is start off with a group communication simulation that was created by the University of Colorado. And this is an example of a multiplayer simulation. I'm gonna start by showing you the facilitator side because that gives a little bit of orientation and also shows you what a faculty would typically see when they log into a simulation. So here I'm logging into the, this, um, this group communication simulation and it's a public policy simulation where different students would play different roles and interact with one another to make decisions together. And what you can see here are five students who are logged in together. They haven't started yet. And they're each representing a different role. We have one person who's playing the water authority manager. There's a forest service district manager, mayor, a coalition representative, and so on. The, the premise of this simulation, to give you a little bit more context, is around wildfire mitigation in Colorado. So there's a fictitious town called Westmount. And in this town, there's um, forests that surround it. And there's a need to do wildfire mitigation. Um, but there's different uh, people and different groups within this town that have different interests. And they're coming together to make decisions around how to effectively do wildfire mitigation. So that's a little bit of the premise of it. Here, again, you can see the setup from it for the simulation. And what I'm going to do from here is go to um, the login for one of the students who would be playing this simulation. And I'm going to go first to the prepare section. And you can see right now, I'm logged in as the water authority manager. So most simulations will have a prepare section like this, where you see a background on what your role is, a little bit more around what good group communication is. Here's a backstory about the town of Westmount and what's going on with them and this reservoir and sort of different regions around the city and things. There's uh, other information that explains what, how wildfire works and what the issues of wildfire are within the, the city. And then there is role specific information that occurs. One of those is metrics. So I click on here because I'm playing the water authority manager, I see specific personal metrics for them such as uh, what the water safety rating is, environmental rating and ecosystem impact, community approval, et cetera. Um, and then I also am gonna get some news. So I can find out what's going on within my region. There's social media feeds and other things. Um, and then the main interaction that occurs here is I'm able to, um, to make decisions around what kind of action I'm gonna take within the city. Do I wanna do you know, mechanical thinning, prescribed burn or manual thinning and things like that. So that's one of the roles, but then there would be a separate role here. Let me log in as, a, as another player within this five person simulation. And here I'm logged in as the mayor of Westmount. And if I click on metrics for this person, you can see the personal metrics because they're in a different role are different. So they care about things like new jobs created, tourism attractiveness, community approval. And so their perspective is different. And what happens within this particular simulation is that the, uh, five people that would be playing together would communicate either through a Zoom session, kind of like we are today, or um, they would also communicate uh, maybe in person, you know, post pandemic or something, where they would be able to uh, sit together and have a conversation around what kinds of, uh, of, of things would they like to do within this particular region, what kind of, uh, you know, if they want to do a prescribed burn for a particular area or something like that. Um, and then also, um, manual thinning and, and, and they would have a conversation around that in advance and then there are events that occur as the simulation progresses. So they would, they would continue to have this meeting until they made decisions about what they wanted to do. And in this simulation, the way it works is the facilitator advances the round. So when, the, when everyone is submitted and they're ready, the, the facilitator advances to the next round. Now we're in round two and the players then would see uh, the simulation advance and get news about what happened in the previous round and uh, then continue to make decisions as a group as they um, you know, prepare for this wildfire mitigation. So that's one style of a multiplayer simulation where, again, uh, 
individual players will work together within the same world. And there might be multiple worlds that are occurring within a single class session. Um, another style of simulation, as I mentioned, is a scenario planning or policy comparison simulation. And um, this one is an example of one that was developed by a German uh, a professor uh, who is interested in exploring the effects of, of infectious disease. And this is something that was built this spring. Um, and it's around, of course, uh, the coronavirus. And so it does an introduction here. There's a video that's available that explains how the simulation works, hosted on Vimeo that's on here, an overview of the simulation, the effects and things like that with outcomes that occur in the simulation. And the purpose of this one is to experiment with different policies. And so what you would do in here is you would go to, um, uh, for example, um, virus transmission parameters. And you might get into what, you know, what is happening within this population in terms of the, um, uh, the, the, the contact rate that people are having, what kinds of, of um, are, what kinds of things are people doing within this community to reduce, I actually go to this, the behavioral parameters, uh, what we can do to improve social distancing, for example, um, you know, and uh, uh, maybe also mask wearing and things like that and how that might change over time. So I can put in a parameter and then I can say, I'm ready to simulate. I'm going to call this my social distancing uh, scenario and hit save and simulate. And then what it does is it creates a comparison of outcomes where I can compare what happened from the baseline to my social distancing scenario. You can see it's running out for uh, the full time here. And here's running out for about a year in days going forward here. And there's a bunch of different reports that are available for kind of examining what the impact of this specific policy that I dialed in by changing the parameters, uh, you know, how it's happening over time. So these are two different styles of simulations. And not only are they different in terms of the way that they're interacting, but you see a style difference as well. I'd say this simulation um, it has sort of more, um, you know, it has, it has a design that sort of follows the University of Colorado design and things like that. And this simulation has, I'd say, a slightly simpler design, but still a very functional um, and uh, a successful simulation. And I think these two simulations, not only do they illustrate the difference between, you know, a scenario planning or policy comparison simulation and a multiplayer simulation, they also illustrate different ways of building simulations together. So let me explain a little bit more about that. Um, there are really two different audiences for the Forio um, uh, platform. And one of them is illustrated by this person here. And this uh, may be you. Uh, this is a uh, professor. It was meant to re represent a professor who um, has an idea for uh, building a simulation that he would like to share with his class. And, uh, uh, and he has built a model in something, but he has no experience with HTML. He has no experience with web design. Um, and he could use help with that. He's going to be building this model on his own um, independently. And, uh, um, and, and, and we, with Epicenter, the Epicenter supports this type of user with the platform for, for an individual person building a simulation by themselves um, in preparation for their own class. And there's also a type of simulation, which is more like the University of Colorado one, where there is a group of people who collaborate together to build a simulation. And this team might consist of a UI UX designer. It would consist of some kind of modeler. This person might be building a model in Excel, or they might be building a model in Python or something like that. It would consist of one or more web developers uh, uh, creating the interface for the simulation. And often this type of simulation would be released to you know, thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people. So there'd be QA that would go into that, make sure it would work on a variety of different browsers. And because there's so many people involved, um, there'd be a project manager. And we think of this kind of team as building what we think of as high production value simulations. But uh, both of these, both this type of person who works by, by themselves uh, building a simulation and uh, this group that uh, wants to build a simulation where there's sort of a separation of responsibility and different skill sets that are coming together are supported through the platform. And the way we handle that is by um, providing a stack of technologies within Epicenter for building interfaces. And uh, at the top of the stack, we have this, these interface templates that are what you see is what you get templates for building interfaces. These are really good for an individual who's building a simulation by themselves 
Um, and then below that, we have uh, Flow.js, which is a little bit more complex uh, for building things, but allows for additional flexibility. And then for professional web designers, epicenter.js is a typical library that's used by them for using you know, more sophisticated web technologies like React or Angular or things like that. And then we also have a set of APIs that are available. Um, so there's a bit of a trade-off in terms of where you are within the stack in that at the top of the stack, things are easy to build, but they're providing templates so they're less flexible. And as you work down the stack, things are more complex in order in terms of writing stuff, you're working with HTML and JavaScript at that point, um, but then you have additional flexibility. And you can move around in the stack as you see fit, depending on your own experience um, uh, with those kinds of technologies and also your sort of need for additional flexibility in terms of the design that you're creating. So from here, what I'd like to do is jump right in to showing you how we go about building a simulation like this. And like I said, what I'd like to do is start off by showing you a little bit about um, uh, uh, building the model first and then jumping in from there. And um, I wanted to find sort of a simple example. Again, I wanna build a very simple model with you um, that uh, hopefully is interesting uh, and obviously public policy oriented. Um, so we're gonna just do something really quick and it's not gonna be the best model that's ever been created, but I think it'll, uh, it'll illustrate the point. And what I thought we could do is sort of a simple um, COVID style um, uh, infection model to kind of show what the impact of, kind of like we saw with this, that last model, um, uh, what the impact of social distancing and mask wearing are. And I'm just gonna do this in about you know, seven or eight equations or something like that to kind of put it together here. Um, actually, I, I just remembered, I want to ask one other question of all of you before I jump into that. And, you know, I shared a couple of examples right now. Um, I, I'm just curious for everybody, what kind of um, simulation would you like to see uh, us uh, do today? Let, let me, let me um, ask the, the next question here. Um, and uh, oh, I just realized that, uh, um, let me just go back to the poll here. Um, let me ask another question. What kind of simulation would you like to see us uh, create today? We could do a single player turn-based simulation, a multiplayer simulation, or a scenario planning simulation where we compare results. I'm just gonna go ahead and let people put together what, what, they're, what they'd like to see come out from today for the different types. Um, I'm seeing a range of outcomes. I'm gonna keep it open for a couple more seconds here to see what comes out. All right, I guess we're gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share results with everyone. And uh, what you can see here is that uh, the vote today is to do a scenario planning simulation. Um, some people are interested in multiplayer simulations as well. If you are interested in multiplayer simulations and you, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll send you after this a link to a webinar that we did um, not too long ago that explains more about how to build multiplayer simulations. But what I'll do today, since there's a lot of interest in scenario planning simulation is use that technique for kind of sharing results today and showing how all of this works. All right, so that was really helpful. Thank you for that. All right, um, so um, let's continue on with the, um, uh, with building this out here. And what I wanna do again is, is, is build a simple model in Excel. And I'm gonna start by um, putting in time as sort of a, something where I want to be able to plot uh, time, you know, uh, say months here over a few months, with, uh, over a year or something like that regarding um, this plan here. We'll run this out, I guess, for 12 months or so. That's probably a bit more than I need to do. Um, and, uh, you know, this will be the first, uh, this will give me a little bit of a sense for, for how we're going to be advanced. And then what's going to happen here is we're going to look kind of column by column for outcomes within the model here. And what I want to do is look at a fictitious population of people. Um, and so I'm going to have population in here. I'm going to start off with, uh, say, a 10,000 person community. And I want to just kind of keep it at 10,000 as we kind of advance through. Let me just make this a little bit smaller here so I can see what's going on a little bit better. All on one page. There we go. So um, and uh, we're going to just keep that population at uh, 10,000. And then there's going to be some people who are infected over time within the population. We're gonna start off, let's say with 100 people who are infected uh, with uh, um, uh, COVID or the flu or something like that. And um, then what we wanna do is look at the susceptible population. And the susceptible population is going to be simply the population that's out there minus the people that are already infected. So that's kind of what we wanna be able to see with that over time. So now we see 
you know, infected plus susceptible equals the total population here. And now we want to get into what is the infection rate over time? And there's going to be a couple of things that are going to influence that. We'll have contacts uh, per month. And this is the number of people. This is kind of getting back to the, maybe the, uh, the social distancing part of it. We're going to say in this community, uh, people talk to 10 other people per month. They're out there, you know, uh, say not social distancing with 10 people per month, something along those lines. And then the infections uh, per contact are the, you know, the, the mask wearing impact here. So what we're looking at is the likelihood of getting infected if, if you come in contact with somebody. I'm going to say that's, uh, you know, 10% uh, or something like that initially here. And then from that, we can determine the infection rate. And the way the infection rate is going to work here is we're going to say it's the number of infected people times the number of people that they talk to each uh, month times the uh, infections per contact or likelihood that someone gets infected from contact. But um, we also want to limit it in some ways that so if you've already been infected and you're talking to an infected person, then you really want to, um, and that person cannot get reinfected or we'll assume that's true in this case. And so we want to limit it to only the portion of the population that is susceptible. So we'll put that in there as well. Um, and that'll give us sort of the infection rate over time. Um, Okay, so, but we also wanna have some policy parameters in here to experiment with. And what I'm gonna do is add in social distancing as a policy parameter. And I'm gonna make it very simple today. I'm gonna to say, uh, it, this is an index scale between zero and one. And if it's uh, is zero, that means there's no social distancing going on. And if it's one, that means there's a perfect social distancing going on. And then secondly, I'm gonna do uh, mask wearing. And I'm gonna kind of use that same scale of zero to one, which means zero, there's no mask wearing. And then uh, one means everyone's wearing a mask, mask perfectly. And that is then going to influence that social distancing is going to influence the contacts per month. So what I'm going to do with that is multiply this times one minus the social distancing parameter that we have here. Um, oops, I didn't do that quite right. Um, the social distancing parameter here, uh, try again. There we go. All right, and then uh, what I want to do with infections is have that work the same way. We're going to do equal to the 10% times one minus the mask wearing parameter that I'm going to set in here. That's going to be scaled to from zero to one. So I've almost got my model together. We're almost done here. The only thing I need to do yet is to um, kind of show um, how these things are, are changing over time. And the infected for the next month is going to be equal to the previously infected plus the um, the um, infection rate from the previous month. So that's going to show the newly infected people for the month. Uh, the susceptible is going to work the same way from month to month here. So I'm just going to bring that across. Um, these contacts and the infection rate and, uh, and these pieces here are going to just come over this way. And what I want to have happen here too is I want the social distancing to be equal to the previous value so that you know as I change this, it can go forward here. And then I think that's about it for my model. So dragging this across, I can see how this is changing over. Actually, there's one other little thing I want to do here, which is I don't want to get um, this kind of rounding thing that's happening here. So I'm going to uh, put this in where I'm going to say um, the um, where we can't have a portion of a person get infected. It's a, just a little detail. We don't really have to do that, but I think it would just be slightly cleaner if I did it that way. So that way now we're going to not get fractions of people who are infected and it sort of works out that way. So there we can see the pattern. It's kind of growing from 100. It, it kind of peaks right now at 2,500 or so, and then it starts to diminish again. And then, you know, uh, that, that's kind of the infection rate within this community over time. So we're almost done with the model. Um, what I want to do, though, with this model is provide a way where I can, um, uh, where I can easily reference variables in this model in Epicenter. And the way I do that is I'm going to use um, I'm going to use a, a range name. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to select this whole area here. And I can go to something called insert in Excel and then go to name, create name. And then what I'm going to do is go to the left column here. And what it does is the things to um, pass the, the leftmost column, column A here, are going to become range names. So what I can see here, for example, is uh, in susceptible, if I highlight this whole section, what you can see is this is now named susceptible up here. And if I go up to this one, which has 1 through 12 in it representing months, this, uh, this range is called time now. And that's just going to make it easier for me to refer to 
different sections of this model when I build out my epicenter model. And then finally, what I want to do is just say, how many steps do I want the model to run when I begin? And because I'm building a scenario planning simulation, I'm going to start off with um, step zero here. So let me go ahead and select that. I'm going to do insert name, range name, and create. It's going to take that leftmost column. And now this cell is named step over here. And now we've got our whole model together. I'm going to go ahead and save it. So now we have a working model, a very simple one. Uh, it's sort of interesting to explore some of these uh, dynamics here. And we want to go into Forio Epicenter for um, building the interface. So let me go to Epicenter here. And um, what I, what's happening here is I am uh, in the NASPA account. And right now that account is empty. There's been no simulations built inside of this account. Um, and as I mentioned, at the end of the webinar today, we're going to share with you information around how to um, access uh, this account so you can create your own simulations in here um, and you can use some of the features that I'm going to be illustrating today. <clears throat> so um, what I'm going to do here is start off by creating a project. This is sort of the first step for uh, building a simulation. And what I'm going to be asked to do is create my uh, project name here. And I'm going to call this um, my... Uh, 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 social distancing and, uh, and, and mask wearing simulation. Okay, so that, that's what I'm going to be doing here. And what you can see here is um, what, what uh, Epicenter does right off the bat is it creates a project ID, which is going to determine, is going to create the URL for your simulation. Um, and you can see what's happened here. One of the things that URLs generally have is they don't have capitalization and they also don't have spaces in them. So you can see here, my social distancing and mask wearing project name has been converted into social distancing and mask wearing with dashes between the words and everything lowercase. Then I'm asked, what kind of access do I want to provide to the users who are running this? Um, and we saw today a couple of different approaches for how simulations are used. And on one hand, we had a simulation that required login. This is called authentication for logging into a simulation this way. And another style of simulation is this one that we shared here, which is um, no login required. Anybody can access the simulation um, at any time. And um, that's what we're really getting into here. We have these three levels of access, authenticated, which was, means we are going to require end users to log in, um, public, which means that anyone in the world can access the simulation and run it. And the last one is private. And what private means here is simply that only you as the simulation author can run the simulation. So just to be clear, the models that are uploaded to Forio Epicenter, like this the spreadsheet model I'm about to upload, are never shared with the end users. Those models are unavailable to end users. It's only the interface that gets shared. Um, but what we're providing here in terms of access is public access to the interface or login required to access the interface to the simulation required. So for today, what I'm going to do is use authenticated access because I want to be able to show use some of the features around how authenticated access works. So I'm going to go ahead and create a project. And here we have the project open around our social distancing and mask wearing simulation. And for fun right now, I'm just going to click on the URL that I created just to see what happens. But remember, I haven't uploaded anything yet. I have no model in here and no um, uh, user interface. So I get the Forio robot who says the project page you're trying to create is unavailable. And that's because nothing has been developed yet. But we kind of see where we're heading with this a little bit. And now we can see the structure of uh, the project within Epicenter. We have a folder for adding a model. And this is where our models will go. And in this case, we're going to have the Excel model that's going in here. And we have another folder for creating our interface. Um, and this is where the HTML files that are going to be um, generated are going to work within, um, within this tool eventually. So the first step to building this style of model is to provide the, um, the style of, of simulation is to provide the model that we just created. So what I'm going to do is go to um, my folder here that has the model that I just uh, added here. And let me confirm that it's the right one. Right now I am in San Francisco. It's 1030 AM. And I can see here at 1026 AM, I have my model that I just created with you. I'm going to drag this into the um, uh, to uh, the, the web page, and you can see it's uploaded my uh, model.xlsx file. So this is the name of my model that I just created. This is uh, this model here that I just created. Okay, so now I've got my model in place. And a, a key thing that you want to do when you are building a simulation is first, just like I did today, start by um, 
creating your model and kind of testing it in the environment that you built it. And if you build a model in Excel, you can experiment with that model and, and try out different ideas and things like that. And then, um, and then once you have it working in a way that you feel comfortable, then upload the model first before designing the interface. The other reason that you want to upload um, a model first is because when you're using that template tool, sort of that top of that stack that I mentioned a moment ago, right? So uh, this, uh, if we're using these interface templates, one of the things that Epicenter does to help you uh, at this top level stack is analyze your model and make suggestions around what kind of interface you might want to build or what kind of simulation you want to build based on that model. And you do that by using this interface builder tool. So I'm going to go ahead and click on interface builder here. And what it's doing now, it's looked at the model, the Excel model that I just uploaded, and it's making some suggestions of types of simulations that I can build using the Excel model that I just uploaded. And it's saying you can, with what you just created, you can create potentially uh, four different types of simulations or four different types of interactive um, tools within Epicenter. One is a single player turn by turn based simulation. And if I wanted to, I could click on this and start building one right now, uh, you know, as an example of what we want to create. We could also potentially, I think, you know, to be honest, I think it'd be a little bit hard to build a multiplayer simulation for this, but maybe, maybe we could do something where we have some people select mask wearing and some people select social distancing. Um, but I wouldn't say this is the best model for multiplayer simulations. Um, and then the uh, third type is run comparison. This is a scenario planning piece. This is the type of simulation that we're going to build today. So this is what we're going to be working on. And then finally, you could, because it's an Excel spreadsheet, you could just build a simple calculator using this tool as well. But because um, our group today is mostly interested in the scenario planning style. I'm going to start with that. Um, and maybe I'll jump if we have time at the end of showing a little bit of a single player. Okay, so um, now I clicked on the, um, the, uh, the comparison, the run comparison or policy comparison simulation type. And what you can see here is Epicenter is providing me with a set of templates that are available for building out my simulation. Um, and these are starting points. If I don't like these templates, I can change them and I can add to them and things like that. Like for example, if I click on this add page, for example, I can see you know, multiple uh, types of pages that I can um, design that I can choose from for extending the simulation if I want to. Some of these are text pages, some of them are input or decision pages and so forth. So there's a bunch of, a, a variety of different types of, of, of pages that can be built out here. Um, what I'm going to do for now, though, is kind of keep it at this level. And what I want to do is kind of like what I saw in, in some of the other simulations that I shared a moment ago, is I want to uh, provide an introduction and a title and start to make this look more like a simulation that um, other people are going to use here. So I'm going to start off by clicking on header and footer settings. And I'm going to give this, uh, this simulation a title. I'm going to call this my um, uh, uh, social, um, social distancing and mask wearing simulation. And um, what I have here too is, um, you know, I can put a header logo in here. In advance of this, I found a logo that I thought might work well. I have a little COVID icon that I found online. Here it is. And so I'm going to go ahead and use that as my icon for my, um, uh, for the simulation. I'm going to go ahead and accept that. And you can kind of resize it there. And then I can select it for the uh, logo there. Now, if I go back to the introduction, you can see what this looks like. So I can see the title here, and I can see the, the icon that I selected here. And you can see that is available on all the different pages that we'll eventually get to for building this out. Next, I can fill in some information around the title. I might say, welcome to the simulation. Um, and then I can provide some introductory text. And what I did in advance today is I um, grabbed some text that I thought would work because I didn't want to waste our time kind of filling in text. But what you would do is you would uh, you know, write some text or paste some text in as I'm going to do today to kind of explain what the simulation is about. You can also um, add different media. You can do images, for example, or videos. We saw in um, one of the simulations earlier that someone used a Vimeo video, so they can be hosted really anywhere, but YouTube also works here. And um, so what I found was a, a YouTube video that's available that is about mask wearing. And so I'm going to go ahead and put that one in here. Um, so this is about wearing a mask and practicing social distancing. I'm just going to put that in as my page here. So this looks reasonable as my introductory page to the simulation. And from here, what I want to do is add um, some reports where I can see outcomes from the simulation. 
And it's also making some suggestions about what kinds of reports we wanna have here. And because we're building a policy comparison simulation, it's laying these out in a way where we're going to have multiple policies that we can compare against one another within the simulation because we selected that specific type in this case. So let me start by um, building a chart type here. I'm gonna put in a uh, line chart initially here. And what I wanna do is select an outcome that I'm interested in from the simulation. And probably a good one here would be um, this infection rate. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and have an infection rate comparison uh, graph that I wanna show and see how my different uh, policies kind of compare to each other as I advance over time. And then what I need to do is define a variable um, for my y-axis here. And let's just take a look again at the model for a second here. Here are the variables that I have available. And I think the key one I'm interested in right now is this one where I can see this infection rate changing over time in number of people infected per month. Um, and that variable is called, you know, as we noted earlier, it's called infection rate up here. And Epicenter has this very useful feature called model, model inter introspection. And what that means is the simulation can look inside, in this case of your Excel model, but also other types of models and help you find variables here. So here, what I'm interested in is the infection rate variable and you can see it found it right away here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And here it's plotting out how that infection rate is changing over time. And you can see it goes up to 2,493 uh, people. And just looking back at our model here, we see that same number, 2,493 people. So it's plotting out the results from my um, Excel spreadsheet here for that, for that outcome. So I've seen uh, one of my results here coming in. I might also be interested in seeing how my policies affect things like um, social distancing and mask wearing. So let me go ahead and add a couple more charts around that. What I'm gonna do here is do a line chart around social distancing. And I'm gonna choose my social distancing variable. And notice now if I start to type the name of that variable, I typed SO here, it looks up the name of that. So it's gonna be social distancing and it's gonna plot that out over time. Now you can see here, um, social distancing is at zero, right? It's, it's never, there's no social distancing going on within this community. And, but I don't like the scale of zero, one like that. What I probably wanna do is think about this in percentage terms, um, but we can see it's at 0% initially here. And I actually don't even like the zero, 100.0%. Uh, 0 so one of the things you can do with this, which is sort of nice is you can put in um, a different format and save that. And you can see by my putting in pound 0%, it reformats this in sort of a cleaner way for this one. So that's useful. I'm also gonna do a mask wearing um, variable like this. And um, what I'm gonna do for that is select um, mask wearing as the plot here. And then again, what I'm going to do is select um, this new format that I've added so I can see both of these things are at zero initially. Okay, so now I've got my basic setup with that. And what I need to do here is provide some uh, policy decisions. So decisions that I can make where I can experiment with different outcomes and compare them to one another. Um, and what I wanna do here is uh, click on a decision type. So I'm gonna add multiple decisions in here. And what you can see are different um, options here for selecting different types of inputs. I'm gonna go ahead and select a uh, slider here for the first one, because I think that's gonna be the most useful way of entering information. And also a nice thing about a slider is it limits the type of input so I can force it to be you know, between zero and 100%. I don't want anybody to enter in negative numbers. I don't want anybody to enter in numbers above 100% because that's, you know, will break my model. Um, so I'm gonna just do it this way. And what I'm gonna do is create my social distancing uh, parameter. And I'll put in my variable here, which is going to be um, social distancing, here it is. And I'm gonna choose my number format again of, uh, of percentage. And I'm gonna say it can be as low as zero and as high as one, um, and it's gonna go increments of 1% or 0.01. So there's my social distancing parameter set up. Of course, at the beginning, it's starting at 0%. I wanna do another one here with this. I'm gonna do this mask wearing, um, and I'll put in a variable here of, um, of uh, let's get the mask wearing variable here. There it is, and put the format in and go from zero to one again with 0.01, um, and I've got that set up. Okay, so um, I actually now have a completed simulation. I'm gonna go ahead and save this. Um, and um, I'm going to go back to my project homepage. And now I still have this URL in here. I'm gonna click it for now the second time. 
and uh, see what happens when I run this when I open this up. And I'm now logged in as the author. I can see um, see the results of the simulation, and I can see you know sort of this introduction to the simulation here. It talks about how to wear a mask. I can play this video. According to the CDC, COVID nineteen. We're not going to play the whole thing right now. Um, I see my dashboard available right now, and it's showing me the baseline run uh, from my model with the social distancing and mask wearing in here. Um, notice also that I can download these charts if I want to; they're available. Um, I can go to decisions here and see the initial decision set uh, to zero for social distancing and mask wearing. Um, I might try a policy where I do 50% um, social distancing. So this is my uh, social distancing uh, scenario. I'm going to go ahead and save that and run it out. And now I see a new line of uh, outcomes here for social distance versus baseline here. Um, and I can go back again and say, let me try another policy. Um, I still keep the social distancing on here, but I'm going to do social distancing and mask wearing together, both at 50%. Um, let's say uh, social distance, um, let's see if I can spell this correctly, plus mask wearing. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and simulate that. And now I see another line. You can see this is even lower here. And if I want to, I can re remove possibilities. If I don't want you know, some of these on here, I can select among these and things like that. And I can see the comparison here about what happened. <clears throat> here, I can see the one where we did social distancing and mask wearing are both at 50%. In this one, the social distancing one, what we see is uh, social distancing is at 50%, mask wearing is at 0% here. Um, and uh, you know, there's other ways of extending this. But this is a good starting point uh, for building this style of simulation. Um, Okay, so uh, it, the, the next thing I want to show you with this is how do you go about creating groups of students who can play this together? Because right now I've been testing this as, um, as an author. Um, and you know, let's, let's do something else here. What if I go to this and I try opening this in an incognito window? Let's go ahead and do that. And what you can see now is it's asking me to log in, but there's a problem for my end users, which is uh, my end users don't know, I don't have any uh, logins that are available for my end users here. So what I want to do now is be able to create end users. And the way that I do that is go to groups. So a group would be like a class, a class of students who are playing the simulation. If I click on groups, I can go ahead and add a group in. I'm going to say this is my uh, spring um, 2021 class. Um, and what you can see here, I can give it a name here. It sets a start date, which is going to be today. It starts and it sets an expiration date, which is uh, six months from now. But if I don't like that, if I want it to expire sooner, meaning that students would no longer have access to the simulation, I can set it up for April 1st, I suppose. Um, I can give it a, assign it a class name, and I can also assign a number of end users. Um, usually, you, you can leave this blank if you don't care about the number of end users that are going to be in the simulation. But a lot of times, this will be controlled because a lot of people who use this platform are selling the simulations that they're building and you know, providing subscriptions to it. And so then in those cases, you want to be able to set the number of end users. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to say, we're going to allow for a maximum of uh, 10 end users here. OK, so now we have a group created, but we have no end users in our account. What I'm going to do is click on Add End Users. And we can see multiple ways of adding end users to this account here. We can have um, invite them. We can upload multiple end users, or we can allow people to even self-register if we want to. Um, the most common way for classes would be to download a template and then to upload that template for adding end users. So let me go ahead and do that here. So here is um, this, uh, this end user template. And what it's asking me for here now are the uh, names and usernames and passwords for this class. I'm going to say. Uh, user test one, um, let's see if I spell that correctly, yeah, user test one, and then I'll make the other two fields just identical to that. I can do that here with Excel. Sorry, that's a bit small, I know. Let me make that a little bit bigger for you to see that. And then I'm going to go ahead and add, say, five users to this account. If I drag this down, I'll have those here. So, well, that's six. All right, so I take those five here. I'm going to go ahead and um, save this. And this will be my user's account here. Let's see how I can quickly get to uh, this folder. This will be my end users. So now I have my end users here with these accounts in them. 
I'm going to go back to Epicenter now and upload that spreadsheet that I just had where you can see end users here. And now I have these five end users added to the account. Um, you know, and this account is going to be available and I can see who's in here right now and who's using it. And now if I go back, let's take one of these here. So it was user test one. I go back here. Um, actually, let me go back here as uh, incognito mode. So I'm not playing as the author. And I can put in my username and my password and log in. And what this will do now is will save my results as I play. So if I go in here, you know, and run a scenario where I do something I haven't done before, which is full, you know, this is full social distancing here, right? I'm going to go ahead and save this. Then I see uh, that outcome relative to the baseline here. And that was, you know, obviously a very effective strategy here. And I log out now. And then I later want to do this again. Um, and I want to log back in. It's going, because I now have an account, it's going to remember that outcome that I had done before. So it shows both of those against each other here. And I, you know, this is my own account and it's not, it, it, it doesn't disappear after, uh, after uh, I use it because I, um, am, I'm not using that public account here. Okay, so that was a quick introduction to um, some of the features of Epicenter. I wanna give you a couple of uh, reminders on how the platform works and what you need to do if you're building your own simulations here. Uh, one of the things is you need to remember to, you should name your ranges in Excel spreadsheet to reference them easy in the interface. And if you remember that, what I did was I used that define range name in Excel and that let me name my ranges. And then I could use that as the, um, the variable name when I was creating my interface. And then secondly, you should create both a time range that's specifically called time. Um, and it's just time by itself and a step cell in your spreadsheet so that it knows where to advance. So let me just show that to you again in um, the model that we created. Here we had the time range and it ran from uh, one to 12 and that tells epicenter how it wants to advance over time. And then we have this step cell here. Um, and what this does is it tells it how many steps should it run at the beginning before the user starts entering decisions and here it's set to zero. So it's those two things that you typically wanna do if you're building an Excel-based model. Um, as we illustrated, we'll also work with other kinds of uh, modeling languages and things. And, uh, and one of the things, because we're hosting this as a NASPA event today, there's access to this NASPA Epicenter account that you can get um, and so that you can create authenticated or password protected simulations like I was just doing. And the way that you'll do that is go to uh, forio.com slash epicenter slash register and then register um, as a author. And then you can email uh, Supriya uh, Gallas and you can see her email address here. Um, and then um, you can send her your epicenter account email and then, th then what, uh, what we can do then is um, create a, access to this team account for, um, uh, for the NASPA account that we're going to have. So just to quickly illustrate how that works here, if you're um, inside of, um, uh, let me go here. Um, if you go to forio.com slash epicenter for the first time, if you've never been there before, if you go to this URL, it's going to ask you to sign up and then you just put your information in here. And then you know here you're gonna enter in your email address and whatever email address you use here is the one that you, know, you need to uh, send to Supriya um, and then we'll use that address to get you into the NASPA account. All right. Um, there are other resources that are available online for running this. And um, there's a support forum that's very active where a lot of people ask questions about how to do things um, and you know, get advice from the community, but also uh, a lot of advice from Forio experts. There's also an online reference guard and their guide rather, and there are also uh, webinars that are available as well. So let me just quickly show you those resources. So when you go to Forio Epicenter in the upper right, you can see support. And here's the support forum that kind of explains, um, you know, different things that are going on. Here's someone who's recently asked about how uh, sliders can be chained and other questions that kind of come in. Um, so again, there's, there's lots of information available in this support forum. There's also details and documentation that are available here that explain how Epicenter works. And you can look up you know, different things around, like if I look up Excel here, for example, as a modeling language, it's gonna explain a lot of the things that I explained here around how to upload your model in Excel and what to do, that sort of thing here too. And then finally, um, there are uh, this webinar and other webinars that are available on our website 
Um, and you can find them if you go to forio.com um, and then click on webinars here, you'll see a list of, uh, of webinars that we have available. You know, for those of you who are interested in the um, multiplayer simulations, uh, now where is it? Oh, here we go. Creating multiplayer games and simulations in Epicenter. If you click on this, you'll be able to watch the recorded webinar for this one to learn more about how to do that. OK, we have a few minutes left. I'm going to go to Q&A now and see what kinds of questions people have about the platform and hopefully answer some of them today. Um, and then uh, there's a question here around, are there ways to uh, include elements of both multiplayer and scenario planning in a single simulation? Um, the answer is, yes, there are. Um, so there are, uh, th there are different ways of doing that. You can have both multiplayer and single player simulations. Uh, we have some examples of that. There's an interesting, there's a group that did a public policy simulation about infrastructure in uh, the Netherlands actually that ran it that way. And what they did is they had different parts of the scenario planning decisions that were controlled by different users who played kind of different roles within a, you know, a public policy setting. That may be what you're thinking about doing. Um, and it's certainly possible to do that. The templates need to be extended in order to add that capability. So for, to do that, you're gonna need to drop down into like that flow.js layer that I mentioned earlier. Um, let's see, um, the next question here is, are there constraints that make the Excel table work versus don't work? So are there things we need to have in Excel? Um, that's a great question. Um, so the, there really are very little constraints with Excel. Um, we've taken very complex Excel models and uploaded them um, and they work really well. The only big constraint that I've seen that, um, that I see people run into is, uh, um, using Visual Basic for applications. So there's VBA, if you're familiar with that, it's a programming language that kind of sits on top of Excel and that doesn't work with Epicenter. So you can't do a Visual Basic for applications um, program on Excel or a script, scripting language on Excel and have that work with it. But you know all the Excel functions and things like that work. You can have very large models. Uh, we have models that are even hard to run in Excel that run okay on Epicenter that, you know, that run fine on the platform. Um, and uh, you know, it has full support of the uh, functions and things like that that are available. Um, can you have students in class build simulations? In other words, could you use this as long-term assignment? Yeah, we've had people do that before. That's a neat idea for the sim. I don't think the NASPA account is probably the place to do that if you wanna run it that way. Probably students wanna have their own account. And what I would suggest is that you have them do it as, um, as their personal simulations. Um, so you could have them watch a webinar like this and uh, learn how to build their own simulations. And then you could assign them you know, th their own accounts in here. And the way you would do that uh, probably is just to have them um, sign up for personal accounts. If you sign up for a personal account in Epicenter, let me just quickly show that to you. I guess, oh, I need to go back to where I was here. Okay. So let me show you my personal account. <laughs> And I have a lot of stuff in here, not surprisingly. All right, so here's my personal account with lots of personal projects that are created. So you can create personal projects as well as what we call team projects, which would be like a NASPER project in here. Um, and this would be a good way for each student to have their own um, account in here. If, if you create a, a personal project, there's a little bit of a limitation in here. Um, it's limited to slightly smaller or smaller um, uh, Excel models. I think it's limited to 2,500 equations in the Excel model, which is still pretty big. I mean, you know, there's, there's lots of uh, uh, decent size Excel models that work with that. And it's also uh, limited to either public or private access. So you can't control it where, um, uh, where um, you need a login for it when you're using these personal accounts. But I think that would be a really good way um, to do that, to, to be able to run that. All right, um, I see another question here. Can two people uh, be playing with the model in the same page? And, and the answer to that is absolutely, right? So, you know, let, let's quickly, we, we built a couple of accounts here. So let's quickly take a look at that for the simulation that we had uh, created a moment ago. Um, uh, and uh, I'll show you how that works here just to make it super clear that that's, that's how this runs here. I'm gonna go back to my NASPA account. Here's the social distancing and mask, mask wearing simulation we just created. I'm gonna copy this URL, uh, copy the link address here. And I'm going to go back to remind myself because I can't remember the name of the user. So we have what do we got? User test one and user test two. So let's go here, and I'm going to go um, over here, and I'm going to go to this one, and then log in as user test one, and uh, and I'm going to use that same 
that's as I recall is the password for this one. So I'm logging in here as user test one and I'm, I'm in and I can see my decisions and outcomes here. And I kind of set things up that are running this way. I have my dashboard with my two results here. I can separately here go to another user. Oops, that's not right one, uh, the second. And I'm gonna put in uh, user test two. And now we're both logged in at the same time, but notice that this user is starting fresh. This user has no other runs in, in here right now because they're starting from scratch. They're in their own account. And this user is, um, uh, has you know, two results here that they ran um, because they're also in their own account. So that's how that, that works here. Um, and then I think our last question for today is, is it possible to adapt and add model simulation after you have built the simulation in Epicenter? Uh, absolutely. So let's say, let's go back to our simulation here for a second. And um, here's our model. Um, and let's say we want to change our model in some way. Let me quickly find a, think of a, a way we could change our model. Let's say what we want to do here is um, we want to say that, um, oh, let, let's just add a new variable here. I'm just going to add a new variable, which is, uh, um, what's another va vaccine? There we go. <laughs> so we'll have a vaccine variable here. And it'll be equal to this one. Um, and you know, I guess what that would do is it would affect um, the both the uh, well, it, what it really affect is the infections per contact. So I'm going to add another thing here, which is times uh, one minus vaccine. And uh, then I need to copy this over, right? Because I want it to apply to all these cells here for the infections per contact. And now we see two things that are affecting it, as well as we have vaccine. And what I need to do also here is name this new range that I just created. So I'm going to do insert name create, and it's going to be called vaccine. And so now I can see that this row is called vaccine up here, as you can see. I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'm going to go back to my uh, model here, where I see my model that's uploaded, and go here, which I can now see 1058 over here in San Francisco. Drag it in. I'm uploading or replacing the model. It's asking me to confirm that I want to replace it. Now you can see 1058 is the model in here. I go back to interface builder and I go to decisions and I add a new set of variable type, which I'm going to do one more slider here, which is going to be my vaccine. And uh, I'll put in my new variable here. If I type the word vaccine, I should see it, which I do. So it now recognizes that new model variable that I added. Um, and I'm going to use that same number format that I had of uh, percentage and say it's from zero to one with an increment of 0 0.01. You get the idea at this point, probably. I'm going to go ahead and save this now. And uh, now if I go back here to one of these players um, and I refresh, I have to refresh to get access to this. And I go back to decisions here. You can see that vaccine has been added. Oh, actually, what I need to do is start over again here and kind of create a new run. But uh, I, if I log out, I'll be able to get access to that for the first time because I was in the middle of a run. But that's how you, how you gain access to it. Uh, final question here, can you share your Excel model? Absolutely. What we'll do is uh, we'll do a, a follow up from here so you can get a copy of the Excel model that we built and you can use that as a way of experimenting. All right, I think we answered all the questions today. And I think again, kind of key next step for um, uh, running this out again uh, for after our session today is to um, you know, set up an account by going to forio.com slash epicenter and then uh, email us uh, with your account information and then we'll get you set up uh, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure to talk with all of you and good luck building your first simulation. Bye-bye, everyone.